Hello. I'm a child of the one true king. Say that to yourself. Hello. I'm a child of the one true king. That's what Peter was bringing to the table in Acts chapter 3. That there was something different about him. There was something different about John. There was something different about those 120 plus people that were in the upper room that received the gift of the Holy Spirit. They had gone from death to life. There was a change and they were children of the one true king. And the offer that Peter is, is presenting them is for them to join the ranks of being a child of the one true king. But there was a lot of baggage that comes along with admitting that you're a child of the one true king. Because so often we have storms in our lives, we have, we have issues, we have baggage, we have all of this stuff that, that, that weighs us down that, that oftentimes we don't think we can get over. And then there's times when, when, when God pro provides this, this epiphany, if you will, or this, this vision or this sight of, of what could be, but we're afraid of what can be because we like where we are. And so Peter in Acts chapter 3, which is our text for this morning, is going to take the Hebrews on a little journey through life. He's going to remind them of who he serves, of what they've done, of what the one who he serves has done about it, and then he makes them an offer they can't refuse, but some will anyway. So we're in Acts chapter 3, and we're going to begin in verse 9. You're going to just see 11, but I'm going to, I want to back it up, because if you remember last week, there was a guy that was sitting by, by a temple gate, beautiful, and he was begging for alms. He wanted, he wanted support for the day, and Peter and John said, silver and gold have I none, but that what I have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he did that very thing. Peter and John reached down there their right hand, and lifted him up, and he was laughing and, and praising God, laughing and, or walking and leaping and praising God, praising God that he had been physically restored to a place that he'd never known before, that he was able to walk, and there were lots of people around that gate and, and around that city, and this is their response, and all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they were taking note of him as being the one who used to sit at the beautiful gate of the temple to beg alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. You know, God is the God of wonder. God is the God of amazement. God is the God of the unpredictable. God is the God of uh, you can do it. I can do all things, God says. Peter, uh, Paul says himself, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength or who strengthens me. He is all powerful, all holy God. And these people had just witnessed a miracle that could only be done by God. And so Peter is going to address that in verse 11, while he was clinging to Peter, that's the guy that couldn't walk, while he was clinging to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them at the so-called portico of Solomon, full of amazement. But when Peter saw this, he replied to the people, men of Israel, why are you amazed at this, or why do you gaze at us as if by our own power or piety we had made him walk? So, so Peter, Peter puts a question to him. Why are, you, why are you amazed? Why does, why does this act of God surprise you? Don't look at us. We're just the vessels that God used to perform his miracle. Why do you stand there in amazement? Don't you believe God could do something like that? Don't you think that God's capable of allowing someone to walk even though Medicine and science said he couldn't. So let me, let me just give you the first blank in your, in your sheet. God positions you to exercise your faith. God put Peter and John in the position to fulfill 
their mission to those people that were in the temple. The guy was unknowingly exercising a, a, a belief. He was praising God. Theos is that word for God there. That's, that's the Father God. And so in his ignorance, which is a word we're going to look at here in a little bit, in his ignorance, he was praising God for what the apostles had been, had been able to accomplish by the power of the Holy Spirit through who they were in Jesus Christ. And so they, they were the instruments by which God had allowed this to happen. But it's so much bigger than just a guy walking again. Because John and Peter and the the other apostles have a mission. They have a purpose, and that's to take the good news of who Jesus Christ is everywhere they go. And that mission hasn't changed for us. I know we say this week after week, but our mission is to be Jesus to the world and introduce them as the Savior who has given us new life and given us life worth living. So that's the message Peter and John are bringing to them. So they're exercising their belief. God had just provided a huge miracle. A man's life was changed. God gave the power to Peter and John to perform this miracle, but they didn't take that on themselves. They said, really, don't look at us. You, you need to acknowledge him because he's the one that did it. And so Peter didn't waste this opportunity to go forward in his mission. And so in verse 12, he says, But when Peter saw this, he replied to the people, Men of Israel, why are you amazed at this? Or why do you gaze at us as if by our own power or piety we had made him walk? I, 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 I want to give you another blank here. Sometimes being reminded of the truth can be painful. Sometimes being reminded of the truth, reminded where you came from, what you've done, doesn't feel good. Have you ever done something and you just kind of wished it would quietly go away? And someone walks up to you and goes, oh, well, how are you doing about this? And you're like, what? What are you talking about? Just shh, shh, shh. Sometimes it's painful to be confronted with the truth. But Peter's going to confront them with the truth. Verse 13 says, The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus, the one whom you delivered and disowned in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you disowned the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you but put to death the prince or the originator of life, the one whom God raised from the dead, a fact to which we were witnesses. So guys, this is what you've done. I know it's painful. I know you don't want to believe that you did that. You just saw an awesome miracle of God. But the reality is we didn't do this. God did, and he's the one you owe tribute to. And you crucified, of course, by God's blessing. Jesus had to die. That was just part of, part of the plan, part of God's, God's intention for bringing the Messiah to bring redemption so that we could have life in Jesus, so they could have life in Jesus. They could know what it means to actually have a vibrant, growing relationship with the God of creation the God who sustains, the God who, who does, the God who is, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, the God of all things. But sometimes we really have to be put in our place because here's something that God wants from every person. That's to repent. That's to change the direction you believe, change the direction you're walking, change the direction you're living, and turn from that, if it's not in him, and turn to him in repentance. Allowing that, that holy sorrow to be part of our lives. 
Have you, ever, have you ever done something you regret? Go ahead and raise your hand. Have you ever done something you're sorry for or you regret? I think almost everybody who's above the age of two has something that they, they regret. Even dogs regret. Our dog, one of our dogs, bit our son. And you know what dogs do when they're dogs? And they're somewhat... I was going to say nice human beings, but they're not human beings, they're canines. <laughs> they bite, and then they lick. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I won't do it again. And then he does it again. I'm sorry. Because we live with regret, and we, we have to be taught how to process that, how to deal with that. And that, that's, where, that's where John and Peter want to lead these people that are around the temple. That's, that's what I want to do for us. That's what I would do for myself self, is, to, is to learn to grow, to mature, to not live with regret, but not just not live with regret, regret, but to do things that I don't have to be regretful over. It happens. We always do ridiculous, silly things, and sometimes we do hurtful things. And sometimes that regret can, can consume us and overwhelm us and, and become such a, a, a burden and such a, a, a brick on our lives that we fail to see what God has to offer. And that is forgiveness. That is restoration. That is redemption. And so he offers us life in Christ, but we have to know what we're guilty of. And we're guilty, humanity is guilty of not acknowledging God. And that, that he is holy and we're not, that we're born into sin and that we need a Messiah, we need a Savior, we need Jesus. And that's Peter's message, is the God of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that which you know already... That which you, you do, that God sent a Savior and you murdered him. That's a pretty heavy burden. But is it the truth? Well, yes, it is. As a matter of fact, he goes on, and I've already read it, that, you know, Pilate wanted to set him free. You know, you know the governor. You took it to the governor, and, and Jesus could have lived. Of course, it's God's plan. We know that. But you, brethren, he said, you refused his offer. And so you wanted a murderer to go free while the prince of life was hung on a tree. And just imagine the shame. Imagine the guilt that some of them felt. The regret. The hurt. Because I... I I firmly believe the Holy Spirit of God is, was stirring in their lives. Over 3,000 had just been saved. And Peter's given this, this prime opportunity to do it again, to say it again, to remind them of what they had done. But not only what they had done, because it's not always about what we do, it's about who we are. And they, in their belief, we're believing the Old Testament, which they needed to believe in, without recognizing that God had been faithful in fulfilling his promise to bring a Messiah. Let me read on. Verse 16, and on the basis of faith in his name, it is the name of Jesus which has strengthened this man whom you see and know, and the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect health in the presence of you all. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus brought the healing. Jesus is the one you owe an apology to. Jesus is the one you, you submit to, that you bend a knee to, that, that you surrender yourself to. He is the Messiah. He has come from God. So you know what you've done, but do you realize what God has done? God has provided a way out for you. There was a poll taken of 
of uh, death row inmates. And the poll was, if there was a surefire way for you to escape, would you take it? And of course, the answer was yes, for most of them. Those that said no said this. If I were to be released, I couldn't live, my, live with myself because of what I've done. I couldn't live with myself because of what I've done. Well, let me tell you, Jesus offers forgiveness to everyone. He desires that every person, red, yellow, black, and white, they are precious in his sight. No matter what their gender, no matter what their, what their political party is, he wants all human beings to know that he is the life giver. And because here's what happens when we give our lives to him and we truly surrender to him is he begins to change us from the inside out. Then it's not about political party. It's not about, well, I'm a guy or I'm a girl. or It's, it's, it's not about my education. It's about what does Jesus want me to do? Who is he crafting me to be? Because we can get stuck in the rut of, well, this is how it's always been and it needs to remain this way. And so then someone says, well, why? Because it's always been this way. And God doesn't change. Well, of course God doesn't change. But he wants you too. He wants all of us too. And not, not, not change because we want to change, but be willing to be put in the position for him to change us for his honor and for his glory. Because then it doesn't really matter because we're all in the same boat. And that's what Peter's wanting for these guys, girls and ladies. It's for them to be in the same boat with Jesus as the captain of their ship. Because if, if, if we realize we're all in the same boat and Jesus is the king, then where, where he takes us and where he leads us is exactly where we need to be. But my journey is going to be different than Diane's. It's going to be different than Joy's. It's going to be different than Roy's. And I think that's the awesome thing about God. As he looks at Ray and he goes, Ray, this is for you. He looks at Roy and says, Roy, this is for you. You guys don't have to match up. Yeah, you look alike, but you don't, you don't have to take this one. This one's not designed for you. This one is. And if you'll follow me, you'll realize that. And so that's, that's what Peter is bringing to these people. That's what, that's what the gospel brings to us, the good news. Is that with God, nothing is impossible. Absolutely nothing. And so then, as Peter's winding this little thought up, he, he brings them back to their present reality. And this is the reality. You've sinned. You participated in the murder of Jesus. But guys, don't forget this, that God is the God of mercy. And even the most horrendous sins can be forgiven. I don't know if there's a greater sin than murdering Jesus. I know there's a lot of bad stuff. But imagine if we had been in that group. I know I would, and I hate to say this, that's unforgivable. But God says, no, it's not, Ray. Stop it. That's a lie. I can forgive anything except for rejecting me. So there's always hope, and God is the God of mercy. Listen to verse 17. And now, brethren, I know that you acted in ignorance just as your rulers did. I love that word, ignorance. It's a stupid. It's, it's it, just, an, you're an idiot. You guys didn't know reality. You were immersed in your own set of standards. You were trying to be faithful to the law. 
I applaud that, Peter would say, but you were ignorant in what God was doing, and it's what you, your forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all of those, all of those guys, all of those ladies, they were waiting for this very moment, and you were blind to it. You were ignorant of that. And that's where we've got to remember that God's always merciful. He allows stupid people who do stupid things to be forgiven. And I know if there were kids in here, stupid's not a good word. But sometimes we just, we don't do what we know we should do. And sometimes we don't know what we should do. And so Peter said, you guys, basically, God's giving you an olive branch. He's acknowledging your ignorance but that doesn't make you not guilty. So listen to what he says. Because this is the next one. God is always faithful to his plan. God is always faithful to his plan. In verse 18, but the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of all the prophets, that is, Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Therefore, repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus the Christ appointed for you whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient times. God has done this for you. He's made a way for you. And yes, you're guilty. But basically, and again, that word repent is you're going this way and you turn around and you go the right direction. It's that change. It, it's, it, it's, a, it's a thought change, but it's also a heart change. And with the thought change and the heart change comes behavioral change. Because you're in the same boat. You're on the same team. You're in the same family. We used to sing the song, we are one in the bond of love. My guys remember that song? Yeah, we are one bound together by the love of Jesus Christ. And he offers salvation to all. But salvation is one thing, and that's the greatest gift we could get. But the forgiveness that comes being, being as white as snow, having all of our sin blotted out, having it wiped away is what this text will say. We're brand new. Paul says we're new creations. When Jesus comes into your heart by the power of the Holy Spirit who takes up residence here, we're wiped clean. You guys remember back in the olden days of cassettes? How many of you remember cassette tapes? Oh, we're all old enough in here to remember cassette tapes. I see some of the younger, younger ones going, huh? <laughs> it was this tape, a magnetic tape they would record stuff on, and we, we loved it. had two sides, and it was, it was after the eight-track tape in which you, you know, anyway, I won't go there. But here's how you erased a cassette tape. There were two ways of doing it. You could record over it, which still might leave some residue, or here's what they did. They developed magnets that were powerful enough that if you were to sit or set your tape on it or it on your tape, after a matter of time, it would erase magnetically everything that was on the cassette. And nothing could be recovered. Nothing. Which is part of why we go to digital, because it's always recoverable. But you could wipe that, you could blot it out. You could make it brand new, and you could reuse it, and you'd never have to ha have someone listen to Led Zeppelin when they thought you were listening to Marty Robbins. Jesus is offering to blot out the stain of sin in our lives, and that's what Peter is offering to them, because God's always faithful to his plan. And his plan was to bring redemption to a lost and dying world. 
And that's the message Peter's taking to them. There's hope for you. You don't have to be filled with regret. You don't. You don't have to be fearful. But you can be faithful. And so that's what Peter is offering. That's what Peter is saying. That's the offer that God is presenting to them. Is you can know freedom. You can know what it is like to have hope. To know peace. To know forgiveness. Verse 19 again. Therefore repent and return so that your sins may be and what wiped away is this translation. Other translations say blotted out. I, I personally like blotted out. That's just a personal thing. In order that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Man, are you refreshed today? Today? Man, do you, do you have hope? Is your faith leading you to smile? To be joyful? He offers that to us. And Peter was offering that to them. That when you surrender to Jesus, you will be refreshed. I remember when we used to run and there were always the water stations. And you know, it's really hard to run with a paper cup of water. And so some of us would stop, but some of us wouldn't stop. And, you know, when you're running along and, you know, you got this full little cup of water and it's splashing all over you and you, you, you want a drink, but, you know, you've just run six, seven miles and you're like, oh, that feels so good. Oh, that feels so good. And then by the time you actually get to drink it, it's gone. But you kind of feel refreshed. And so I used to do this to myself. The next one I'm going to drink. And I'd go and I'd pick it up and, you know, I'm, I'm moving so fast. <laughs> and the water would slosh, but I'd, that second time I'd always make sure that I got a sip. Because as refreshing as that was on my bald head, it's some, there's something special when it begins to, to get inside of you. And there's a refreshing that is almost... Unspeakable. But that's Jesus. The refreshment that he offers us is life-changing. It's purpose-changing. It's history-making. He came to change our world through us. I think that's awesome that God would do that. So he offers forgiveness to everyone who would turn to him because he's faithful to his plan. He's the God of mercy. And he's faithful to his plan. And then he brings them, in verse 22, to remind them of what they should already know. The first prophet. Some say the greatest prophet. Moses. Listen to what it says. Verse 22, Moses said, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. To him you shall give heed to everything he says to you. And it will be that, that every soul that does not heed that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. This was God's plan. And so here's, here's the picture. The door is closed. As Peter is, is speaking, that, that door opens ever so slowly, ever so slowly. And he's walking them through. This is what you did. This is what God did. This is who you are. This is what you believe. This, this is what God has done. And now I want to take you back to what you should already understand. It's that this was always God's plan. This was always God's plan. Moses, and maybe Peter did this. How many of you know who Moses is? And everybody would raise their hand because they knew, or both hands, young job. <laughs> they knew. And so Peter was just reminding them of what was familiar. I think, I think that's pretty, pretty bright. 
Because sometimes we're always flashing something new and we have to go back and remind people of what they already understand and already know. Let me read verse 22 again and then I'll finish this up. Moses said, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like him from your brethren. To him you shall give heed to everything he says to you. And it will be that every soul that does not heed that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. And likewise, all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and his successors onward also announced these days. So it's not just Moses. Every prophet was talking about the plan of God. Samuel, now one thing about Samuel, didn't really talk about the Messiah but he put David in place by the power of God. And the lineage of Jesus was, was made. Everything in Scripture points to Jesus. That crimson thread that is woven throughout Scripture. Scripture tells you, tells me, of God's grand plan. And that's what Peter's reminding them. Is God said this. This is the word. See, they had the Torah. They had scripture. Not the New Testament. The New Testament hasn't been written yet. But they knew what God had said. Because the prophets had told them. And so there was this. This, this knowledge that, that he's imparting. And it, it's, it's factual. I, I love what Peter said earlier. We, we witnessed Jesus' resurrection. But Scripture told us that it was going to happen. Scripture is where we find the grand scheme, the grand plan of God. We see what God is up to. I mean, just go to the book of Revelation we see what God's up to. We might not grasp it, we might not understand it, but we certainly are privy to what God is thinking. And the reality is, is we're not ever going to fully understand. And if someone says they fully understand it, they don't. They just don't. But he does. Because it's his plan. God did this for for, for me, did it for you. In Christ, the Messiah, the only Son of God, he changed the way we get to relate to God. We're heirs. We're joint heirs with Christ. We're part of the family. And that's the offer Peter is presenting to them today. But here's the requirement you got to repent. you got to turn. Listen to verse 26. Um, actually, let me pick up verse 25. It is you who are the sons of the prophets and the, of the covenant which God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Don't forget that word blessed. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed. First, for you first, God raised up his servant and sent him to bless you by turning every one of you away out from your wicked ways. So the blessing is that God wants to bless us. And the blessing that we get to live in is that when we turn, he blesses us. God does not bless sin. He doesn't bless sin. Habitual sin, he doesn't bless little sin, he doesn't bless big sin, it's all sin. But he says, when you turn to me, when you repent, you turn from your wicked ways, and when you turn from your wicked ways, you're turning to me, and that is the blessing. When you turn, you're blessed. And then you get to walk in the newness of life. You get to walk in that new relationship no longer at odds, at enmity with God, being God's enemy because you're a kid. 
And that's Peter's message. That's our message. We're, if you're, we're believers, we're living in the reality that Peter is presenting. The reality that Peter is living in. And sometimes it hurts to be reminded how far we are from God. But we need to be reminded. We need to remember what Jesus has done for us, what he's accomplished for us. Because God's purpose and God's plan is for us to be one as he and the Father and he and the Son and he and the Holy Spirit are one. That God is holy. And he says, you be holy because I am holy. God wants what he's done for you to be your ultimate blessing because born out of that comes all the other blessings. And there's not a greater gift that God can give us than salvation itself. So here's what I want you to do. I'm going to ask you to stand this morning. And I just am going to ask you to quiet your hearts. Just listen for another 45 seconds, maybe 50, maybe 60. Are you right with God? I mean, have you, have you been saved? Did, have you asked Jesus to forgive you of your sin? I think a lot of us have. Most of us probably have. And if that's the case, praise God. But if you haven't, Repent and be saved. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sin. I believe that you died for me and I trust you for my salvation. But for the rest of us that that are saved, that know intimately and personally Jesus, are we walking with him? Are we living in the reality and the truth that he offers salvation, that he offers forgiveness? Because here's the catch for this is that if we don't believe it, why would anyone else believe it? Why would they believe our our lack of faith? And so he wants us to be faithful in our walk with him so we can be faithful in our introduction of him to other people. That we live a, a way of life that brings pleasure to God. I want to... Pray for us this morning. Lord, our Heavenly Father, I thank you, God, for for what you've done for me, for what you've done for us, those that believe. And God, I pray this morning, if there's anyone in this building right now that has not experienced the mercy and the grace and the forgiveness of their sins, God, I pray this morning that you would stir so powerfully in their lives, that the Holy Spirit would speak truth and that they would respond Lord, you speak to each one of us, and I pray that we would tune ourselves into you, that we would allow you to speak into our lives, that we wouldn't have to live in fearful regret, that we wouldn't be consumed by the storms that do come in our life. God, that we would know the freedom and live in the freedom that comes from being a child of God. Father, thank you for that gift. Thank you for that that opportunity that is out there for those who don't know you to believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior. And so this morning, God, I pray that we would sing a new song to you this morning, a song of thanks, knowing that we can come And we can bear ourselves to you and that you will forgive us of our sin. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Do what God is leading you to do. Don't be afraid, whatever it is, as we sing.